own the experience where you get it and don't worry about the rest. Um, just make sure that whatever ICU you're picking, that it's something your schools will consider open-handedly. Like, yes, we take you, no questions asked. That's the best way to go into your application. Remember, red flag is individual basis. That's a red flag or on a case-by-case basis. That's a red flag. If it's all you got and it's too late to make a change, applications are due and you tried to you just threw in an extra school for the hang of it, well, then go for it. Well, hello, future CRNA. Welcome back to CRNA School Prep Academy podcast. I'm your host, Jenny Fennell. And today we're going to discuss what is the best ICU experience for CRNA school. I know many of you who are early on in your pursuit know that you are required to have ICU experience, but again, you may be wondering, well, how do I know what ICU experience is going to set me up for success to successfully gain admission into CRNA school and also be successful during your time as a nurse anesthesia resident? So that is what we're going to reveal today. So let's go ahead and get into the show. All right. Welcome to CRNA's Corp Academy podcast. Again, we're going to discuss the um, ICU experience for CRNA school and what all you should be um, aware of when considering what unit to pick as you get closer to graduation from nursing school. Uh, if you have time, if, if this has reached you in the time that you have not yet set up a job yet prior to graduating nursing school, or if you're very early on in nursing school and you're just trying to decide you know, what, what specialty you want to go into, whether you want to specialize in meds, uh, surgical ICU, medical ICU, et cetera, um, or maybe you're exploring other pathways like ER and things of that nature. Um, I'm, I'm glad you found this episode because again, I'm going to kind to, I'm going to try to reveal what are some things you should be considering when picking your, your job outside of nursing school. First and foremost, if you have not already taking a position as a nurse's aide is really the best way to get your foot in the door as a new grad in the ICU. I have a lot of students reach out to me after they've already graduated nursing school and they can't even get an interview in the ICU. And I ask them if they've even had any experience working as a nurse's aide. And a lot of them don't. And it makes it really hard to get your foot in the door after graduation. Really the best way to get your foot in the door period is by working as a nurse's aide. Now I know working as a nurse's aide is not a glorious position. I did it for, I don't know, two years. Um, it's very rough. <laughs> it's a very hard job. Um, but it allowed me to get into an ICU residency program. If I did not have that experience, I know for a fact, I would not have gotten accepted into the ICU as a new grad. So it really was the big determining factor for me to get my foot in the door, to make my name, my name known, um, and really treat it like a long-term job interview. Yes. I know that adds additional level of stress, um, but it also allows you to, to kind of explore that unit. I mean, if you take that position as a nurse's aide and stay in the medical ICU and you hate it, or maybe the environment's really toxic, now you can easily and, and relatively risk-free navigate to the surgical ICU and see if that's a better fit for you. And it kind of gives you this freedom to explore different ICU specialties when there's really no um, long-term commitment as a nurse. Um, and also not really starting truly yet starting your CRNA experience or your ICU experience journey for CRNA school. It allows you to kind of see. So explore the pathway as a nurse's aide. It's really the best way. Again, um, if you have already graduated from nursing school and you're getting the door closed in your face for ICU residency programs or to get in the ICU, really, you might have to kind of suck it up and either start or do two options. A, start on a med surge, move to a step down which again, could take over a year to achieve because you may have to have six months of med surge experience before you transfer to a step down. And then you may have to have six months experience before you transfer to an ICU. But if that's the only pathway that you can take because you, you keep getting the door closed in your face to get direct directly into an ICU residency program and directly into an ICU, well, then that's what you have to do. You're going to have to start in med surge of some kind and work your way up in the, in the step down and then to the ICU. Sometimes step downs will take new grads as well. Again, not always. I know the ICU residency program I did actually also placed new grads in the step down. So they required all new grads that went to the step down to have the residency program under their belt as well. Um, they didn't take new grads directly into the step down either. So, but some, some hospitals will, will, and some hospitals will take directly into the ICUs, but just know that the majority of hospitals seem to like to have 
new grads at least go through an ICU residency program. And this is something that you have to plan for prior to graduating nursing school. And really, it really helps if you can get a good reference letter from someone who knows your work ethic inside the hospital. I, I'll never forget this because she was our Valley Victorian, like the smartest, the smartest person in our entire nursing class of over 200 students. So very smart. She couldn't find a job after she graduated from nursing school as a Valley Victorian. She went to a nursing home to work afterwards because that was the only position she could find. Um, and this was in a major city. And it's because she never, ever worked as a nursing aide. She spent all of her time making sure her grades were good. And I don't know if she ever worked, to be honest with you, but I just know she definitely never worked in the, in the, in the hospital. And it really hindered her. And I was shocked to find out she was devastated and had a lot of regrets um, for not getting that work experience while she was in nursing school. So again, just something to keep in mind. I'm sure she's fine now. <laughs> so I'm sure it has a happy ending. But I remember at the time we we're getting ready to graduate, her sharing that with me and me being like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, you know? Um, so anyhow, let's get into today's episode with sharing <laughs> a, a statement from the COA. What is the COA? The COA is a Council of Accreditation. Now, if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, I hope you have heard me probably warn you that you have to be careful where you take your information from on the internet. Google will find the most high-performing SEO websites and put them in front of your face first and foremost. So they're not always accredited sites, meaning they're usually like bloggers and things like that. Um, and they're not always reputable sources. And a lot of times those websites are not updated very often and things of that nature. So I, I and I'm even speaking for our own, <laughs> I'm speaking even for our own, the best place to get true, truly get accurate information is always going to be from your school's website. Okay. Um, and, and from things like the AANA's website, the NBCRNA, and the COA's website. Even the COA's website, I'm not going to lie, is kind of outdated a lot of times if you look at it, but it, it is like our council of accreditation. So it's legit. <laughs> it's a legit website uh, versus, you know, how to become a CRNA.com. Like, you know, it just be, just be really careful. Cause again, you know, people do, the, do these things cause they, they rank on SEO um, and then throw ads on their site to make money. And it, so they don't necessarily even check the, the fact check. A lot of the things They just know that it's going to get good searches on Google. So just be careful. It's, that's my warning to you. But when researching um, what ICU experience is going to be good for you, there's a lot of things to really consider um, when it comes to that. A, you have to want to work on that unit um, and you have to really know the culture of that unit. Um, even if it's your dream ICU job, the culture may not be a right fit. Um, you want to make sure you're picking an ICU that you're going to thrive, that you're going to have experience for leadership, um, that your manager is going to be supportive. I think I went over that in the la last episode I did last month about there are some managers who just don't want to support CRNA um, related career paths. And I think it's because they're bitter, <laughs> but I have met students who have had a big hindrance because their nurse manager will not write a letter of reference, trying to seek out environments that are at least friendly towards going on to grad school. Some will say, I won't give you a reference letter until you work here for at least two years. And you know, if your plan is to go back to CRNA school in that year, and that's all you need for CRNA school, you don't want to work at a place like that. That's going to hinder you. So trying to find out these things early is another really great way that you can, or start doing as a nurse's aide, talk to the nurses on the unit, find out who's going to grad school and, and for what, if you find one of the nurses are going back for CRNA, ding, 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 make, make sure you, you stay in touch with them. <laughs> and it's a really good way to get that exposure early on and kind of find out the little nuances of the unit. And that maybe is time for you to maybe explore other avenues if you find out the culture is really toxic. So again, it's not all about what you do because you don't have to be a CV ICU nurse. You don't have to be a medical ICU sick. You, you don't have to do any of those ICUs. It's just about what unit's going to support you the most as you get your experience and allow you to thrive, not only getting advanced skills like ECMO and CRRT and different life support um, modalities, but who's going to give you opportunities for leadership, research, um, you know, things of that nature and who's going to be supportive when you let them know you're going back for CRNA school. So that's really, really also incredibly vital when picking your ICU unit, not just the type of ICU. But as far as the type of ICU, we do have to get into that because that does matter. Um, but it's not, in my opinion, as vital as making sure that you're picking the right unit for you and that you're going to thrive in and be supported on. ICU is hard. It's hard. It's rough. No matter what I see, you're going to go into, you're going to see a lot of suffering. You're going to see a lot of death. And so it's going to be a lot mentally. And so you have to make sure again, that you're going to find the support that you need and not be also put into a toxic environment on top of dealing with a lot of stress every day. All right. Enough of that speech. Hope it rings a bell and hope you look into that ahead of time. So you can save yourself from extra stress. All right. So I'm going to read this statement from the COA. 
So it's on critical care experience. And again, CRNA schools like verbatim go by the COA's um, statement on CRNA or um, ICU experience. So again, they're all, but it's open to interpretation <laughs> for the most part for CRNA schools. And you'll see that they, they will vary from CRNA school to CRNA school on what kind of they consider ICU experience. Not a whole lot of variation, but there is. So I'll cover what that is. But this is the statement from the COA. All right. Critical care experience must be attained in a critical care area within the United States in this territories or U.S. military hospital outside the United States. So that's number one. If, if you're getting your ICU experience outside of the U.S., even if it's Canada, I know we're neighbors. Hey, hey. But, you know, it has to be in the U.S. So I have had Canadian nurses reach out to me saying, well, you know, I'm pretty close to the U.S. I'm just in Whistler or whatever it is. Would my ICU experience count? And unfortunately, based on the COA statement, no, you have to come to the U.S. to get your ICU experience. So keep that in mind. So during this experience, the registered professional nurse has developed critical decision making and psychomotor skills. All right. Competency and patient assessment and the ability to use interpret advanced monitoring techniques. Uh, critical care area is defined um, as where one on a routine basis, the registered professional nurse manages one or more of the following invasive hemodynamic monitors, such as pulmonary artery catheters, CVPs, arterial lines, et cetera, et cetera. Um, cardiac assist devices, mechanical ventilation, vasoactive infusions. So you'll see on a lot of serious school websites for the requirements that you must routinely um, manage ventilators um, or at least take, not manage techniques. I know respiratory therapists do a lot of the management, but you take patients on ventilators. You routinely see vasoactive drips. Um, and advanced life support modalities. Um, so again, they'll specifically say those things sometimes because um, it specifically says on the CO's website that they want you to have these types of experiences. It says examples of critical care units may include but are not limited to surgical intensive care, cardiothoracic intensive care, coronary intensive care, medical intensive care, pediatric intensive care, neonatal intensive care, those who have experiences in other areas may be considered and provided they can demonstrate competence and with managing unstable patients invasive monitoring ventilators and critical care pharmacology. So you'll see this almost verbatim statement on a lot of CRNA, CRNA schools websites because they just took it directly from the COA. Um, while yes, it kind of paints a picture, it kind of leaves out some little nuances that um, I want I wanted to kind of address on the show because I see a lot of people still run into questions about their ICU experience and um, ICUs you know, can be, you know, MICUs can be MICUs, but not all MICUs are the same, right? Not all SICUs are the same. Some combine surgical and trauma. Some are just, some are surgical and burn. I mean, they're all different and you may get put in little tiny subspecialties of an ICU. Um, so I wanted to at least cover that. Um, now, when I do my searches and um, education on what CRNA schools require, I go directly to the school's websites um, and again, I'll say that until I'm blue in the face, you have to go to your school's direct website to get the best information. Sure. You can look at my, you can look at Sterling's Corp Academy blog and get an overview. You can go to other blogs and get an overview, but don't do not promise me. And I'm talking for myself included. Do not take every, anything I say set in stone because your school could be different and you have to understand what your school requires. And so that's going to require you to specifically go to their website and go to their open houses and talk to the program faculty. If you're concerned about your ICU experience, um, do not make assumptions. And, and again, you know, make sure you're hearing directly from your CRNA school. Don't take anyone else's advice on the internet and what they think your what your experience is going to be like. If they're not your CRNA faculty or from your program, they really ultimately are not going to be the ones at the end of the day making decisions on your future. So just make sure you're being really careful with that and making sure you're doing your own research from your school's websites. But um, I'm looking at, uh, I think there's Loma Linda. Yeah, Loma Linda, um, their website. And again, um, they take directly from the COA's website and they list that Examples of critical care units may include, but are not limited to surgical intensive care, cardiothoracic intensive care, coronary intensive care, medical intensive care, pediatric intensive care, you know, neonatal intensive care. And those who have experiences in other areas may be considered provided they can demonstrate competence in managing the unstable patients, invasive monitoring, ventilators, and critical care pharmacology. So as you can see, <laughs> they took it directly from the COA's website um, to kind of express what the units um, they cover. So, you know, I would take it for what it is. If you have a unit that kind of, that you're not, you're questioning or unsure about you, you need to make sure that you are asking, um, notice on here, how they didn't mention things like PACU or ER or cath lab, 
OR, um, what are some other ones? Step down, um, LTAX. I mean, I've heard a lot of people give me rationales. Well, an LTAC has ventilated patients. I'm like, they're usually trach patients who are not, you know, critically sick. They're more stable. Yeah, they're still critical if they they ventilator dependent, but it doesn't, it's not the ICU. So again, um, make sure you're not making your own assumptions. Um, again, they want to make sure you're seeing invasive hemodynamic monitors. You're not going to see a swan or an arterial line at an LTAC, you know, so that's again, going to leave out this invasive hemodynamic monitors, such as pulmonary artery catheters, CVPs, and arterial lines, um, you know, and mechanical ventilation is usually more of like, they're, they're being ventilated maybe, and not that trachs don't count in the ICU, but you know, it's not just trachs. Like if you're have a long stable trach patient, are they on vasoactive drips? Are they requ requiring flow land? Are they, you know, what's going on? Are they having a massive GI bleed and requiring vasoactive drips? Um, that makes a critical, critically sick patient that would not be put in an LTAC. <laughs> okay. So think about that. And then who, if you're a PACU nurse, yeah, you might be stabilizing or dealing with a patient temporarily outside of the outside of the OR, but you typically ship them to the ICU as soon as you can or within an hour. And so you're not really managing them long term. Um, yeah, you see A lines and you see swans and you see ventilators, but you're not doing long term management where in the ICU you're managing long term. So they really want to see longer term management throughout this shift, which is also why ER is not considered by a lot of programs because it's short term management. It's, you know, stabilize and ship out. I have had um, someone come to me and they're like, well, Jenny, I have a ICU unit in my ER because we're always, you know, so full that we can't ship to the ICU. And so they have to be there for my entire shift. And while I, I know that that was true and I know, but the schools that this person was applying to, were not recognizing that on her application and giving her a hard time. And I just said, there's, there's no point in arguing this. Like they're clearly not going to budge. You've already reached out. They said they just won't take ER period. It doesn't matter if they tech quote unquote or an ICU area of the ER, they won't take it. You know, they had to be willing to move to change a different unit. If they really wanted to keep applying to these schools um, that said absolutely no ER. So um, keep that in mind. Some schools will take ER, but you won't know this until again, you actually um, do more digging into what your school's requirements are. Now, this school mentions uh, neonatal ICU or neo, neonatal intensive care. That is a unit that's often not accepted um, because this is so sub, it's like a, such, a, such a subspecialty of an ICU. Um, I mean, their pathophysiology is so very different than a true adult of any kind or even a toddler for that matter. And it's usually very unique circumstances that you would be put in a neonatal IC intensive care unit. So you're going to be missing a lot of disease processes that are going on with like the general population. And you don't necessarily see that is often in the anesthesia world. And don't get me wrong. If you go to your peds rotation, you will manage neonatal ICU babies, but you know, not, that's not the majority of your cases. And so most schools will say no to neonatal, but they'll take uh, a PICU, for example, they'll take a, a pediatric ICU and you're like, well, what the heck? And it's because the, the PICU can see a much broader range of patient ages and disease processes than a neonatal ICU. So again, um, that's this another thing I think a lot of students run into is they think that they're covered. Um, and then there's some schools who won't take PICU or neonatal ICU. And so if you don't know this and you're like, I love kids, I can't wait to work with babies. That's what I want to do. And this is kind of heartbreaking to tell someone who's so gung ho to work with babies. Cause I, again, I, I love babies. I'm a pediatric CRNA now, and I just, I, I love every minute of it. It's so much fun. Um, it is kind of heartbreaking to say, if you really want your best shot at getting into your CRNA schools, especially a variety of CRNA schools, adult really is the best widest coverage way to go, because you're going to get more schools who say no to NICU you and pick you than you will. You're not going to get anyone who says no to adult. And so it's kind of like one of those things where it's kind of might be having to kind of swallow a little bit and just do the adult world while you're getting your ICU experience, knowing that in the future, you can specialize in becoming a pediatric CRNA it may not always be the case. Again, if your school openly accepts PICU experience, well then go get PICU experience and, and don't even worry about it. But keep in mind too, that if you want to go to the PICU route, or even if your school takes the neonatal route, making sure you do still understand your adult physiology is really key because you can't just neglect understanding adult disease processes or physiology, because that's a large part of what you're going to be doing. I've also had people who were like, well, I'm going to get a, I need two years of ICU experience. I'm going to get a year in the PICU and then I'm going to go to the adult ICU. So I'm more well-rounded. That's okay. That's, that's cool. That's fine. You know, but again, 
keep in mind um, when you're changing units, it's going to be getting reestablished as kind of a newbie and kind of starting over again with establishing references and things of that nature. So it is best to kind of put your roots down that year leading up to CRNA school, just to make sure you have at least, you know, nine months or more with a nurse manager who really knows you to get a good reference letter versus being like, I'm only been here for two months, but I need a reference letter for CRNA school. Hello. And maybe you're still in orientation. So keep that in mind. If you're thinking about trying to bounce around a little bit, it's not terrible to like get different experiences, but you really shouldn't be bouncing around so much that they're going to be questioning. Are you having a hard time picking a unit because maybe you're hard to work with? Maybe, you know, is there a, a, if they see a bunch of bouncing around and they might put a red flag up and say, is there a reason why you're moving around so much? You know, are you not able to get settled in on a unit and, and get along with your coworkers? I mean, they, they may make assumptions. And again, I wish that wasn't human nature, but it is. So keep that in mind. A daily dose of inspiration from a CRNA School Prep Academy student. I just got accepted to the U.S. Army Graduate Program in Anesthesia Nursing starting in 2023. Some facts about me. I've been a nurse for eight years, the last four and a half years in the ICU. The first two years of ICU was in a mixed ICU at a level three trauma center. They had general MICU, surgeries, head and neck, GI, open heart, working with CRRT, inner aortic balloon pumps, impellas, and ECMO. I traveled as a MICU SICU with, of course, lots of step-down tele floating for two years at various level trauma centers, and then settled at a level one CT ICU for the last six months with heart and lung transplants, ECMO, LVADs, CRRT, Impella, and inner aortic balloon pumps. I did two medical mission trips last summer, one with IVHQ and one with One World Surgery. I highly suggest One World Surgery because I got to shadow five anesthesia providers between three ORs. One was even on the AANA board. I also attended two and one national AANA conferences. These were crucial in meeting with professors and I was even preemptively invited to interview and had multiple invites to see their schools and shadow lectures and labs. Networking and fully immersing myself amongst SRNAs and CRNAs was amazing. And I even grew my own passion for the CRNA political community and I just cannot wait to be an advocate. I also met Richard Wilson and Jenny Fennell, both incredibly welcoming and helpful in meeting with other professors as well. Thank you, thank you so much for everything. I know if you're listening to this right now that you know who you are and it was so incredible meeting you. You just blew me away. Um, the fact that you showed up to these events and you were putting yourself out there. Um, so much to be said for that. And I'm so incredibly proud of you to start your journey and becoming a CRNA. I look forward to seeing you again at future conferences. So you guys, I shared this success story because it is full of little golden nuggets. So I really think you should stop and rewind and jot down some notes. CSB would love to share more golden nuggets with you. So be sure to sign up for our free future CRNA newsletter. The link is in the show notes or comments below. Cheers to your future. Now back to the show. Um, if you're a traveler, obviously travelers bounce around. It's not, but historically before the pandemic, I think they would worry about travelers for that very reason. Like, do they have a hard time just picking a unit and staying put? You know, a lot of people, it's pretty obvious now people do travel, travel nursing for money, like in an experience and a var variation, flexibility, schedule, et cetera. And I think that's very, it's much less, um, things have changed <laughs> as far as how schools view travel experience. But I will say things, some things that have not changed is the quality of your travel and ICU nurse, blah, 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 ICU nurse experience needs to be high, meaning they will question whether you've had good leadership roles or good, really, really sick patients, because usually travelers, travelers do not get the sickest assignments historically. It's not always the case. I know that to be true. However, I'm telling you that you're going to have to prove that through your resume and display that you've had leadership roles, display that you've taken really critical sick patients, display that you're trained in ECMO and CRT, et cetera, et cetera, and you're still a traveler. You know, usually if you can do things like CRT and ECMO as a traveler, it's because you've had a home base prior and you've gotten that training as a, as a home base person. They don't typically train travelers on ECMO and CRT as a traveler. You typically have that prior to traveling. So keep that in mind if you want to travel and make money that you need to be getting at least some really solid experience prior to traveling so you can still get really high acuity assignments. And then again, getting the leadership roles can be really hard as a traveler too, because you're not going to be preceptor or doing charge nurse typically as a travel, but not always. I've had some travelers tell me that if they've had previous charge nurse experience, um, that they're given that role as a traveler. And so just making sure you're highlighting that on your resume, if that's the case, 
Um, and trying to find other ways to have leadership experience, like getting involved in the AACN, et cetera, things that are outside of your hospital are always good ways to still make sure you're getting leadership roles um, other than being a charge nurse or nurse manager of some kind. Um, I think that kind of wraps up that portion. And I wanted to um, kind of go more into different types of units. I know I briefly mentioned some units, uh, but I was looking on school, uh, school's websites and I wanted to make sure that um, I cover like how ICU acuity can differ and why ICU experience is important for CRNA school. So again, all CRNA schools can require different, require similar, but yet different types of ICU experience. I mentioned some of the big units, um, you know, again, they want to make sure that they have a solid background, in hemodynamic monitoring, invasive lines, ventilator support, and vasoactive infusions, along with continuous echocardiogram monitoring. On the COA's website, they said here, I thought that was just interesting, that an article by Burns, which is dated from June 2011, so it's kind of old, <laughs> concluded that the amount of critical care experience was negatively correlated to academic success and progression. Candidates most likely to succeed demonstrated positive correlation with, with overall GPA and science GPA. The reason why I want to point this out is because this study, these, you know, schools love statistics and stats. If things have significant or statistical significance, they're going to pay attention and, and say, okay, well, if this historically pro provides these types of outcomes, we're going to, we're going to change our requirements to fit as such. And so you'll hear things like, oh, if you have, you know, over five years of ICU experience, they won't want you because you're tarnished, tarnished goods. That's not true. But I will say if you do have more than five years of ICU experience or 10 years of ICU experience, you're going to have to prove that you're willing to be a novice again. You're going to have to show them that you're ready and willing to be a student again, that you are, know that you're not always going to be right, um, that you're willing to, again, take the role of a preceptee instead of the preceptor. And it's, if you've been an ICU nurse for 10 years and you've been a preceptor and a charge nurse and a, and, a, and a nurse manager, are you going to be able to go back to be that novice again? And be able to, you know, be respectful with authority and 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 be open and willing to hear that maybe you're wrong. Um, and, and so they, they screen for that during the interviews. So just like test yourself and see how you feel about that. Make sure that you address any, you know, uncomfortable thoughts that come to mind when it comes to going back that route. Because um, again, that, that is what they do worry about that maybe um, you're, they call it like not being teachable or are hard to be hard to teach because you're so resistant to change. You're like, no, it's my way or the highway. You're wrong. I'm right. You know, those types of personalities are incredibly hard to, to work with, <laughs> um, especially in CRNA school, when again, this is a whole new specialty that you're learning. And there's going to be a lot of things that you have to kind of unlearn, um, essentially. And so they do kind of screen for that. I would say still the average is right around three years of ICU experience for CRNA school admissions. It does not mean you need three years, magical number. I'm just, that is, tends to be the average. So I would say in the ballpark between one and five years is where most people fall with ICU experience. Another thing from the COA's website um, that said an article by Wong and Lee in the ANA Journal in 2011, again, um, 2011, concluded that personality characteristics such as confidence and commitment, I'm sure there's more, maybe more accurate predictors of academic and clinical success and a nurse anesthesia education. There, this is why a lot of schools are leaning towards emotional intelligence um, assessments these days, because they want someone who is um, has the growth mindset, who is loves learning and loves and doesn't see it as like a, a hindrance or a roadblock to not know everything to be committed, you know, and have that perseverance, that diligence to show up every day, even when it's hard. Um, you know, they don't need instant gratification to feel successful. They can be self-motivated and they, they screen for personality characteristics like this, because again, if you always need reassurance that you're okay, or, or you need a lot of, you know, or you need someone to stay on top of you to get stuff done or, um, you know, you get a defensive really easily. Again, these tend to be people that's it's harder to change that than it is to brush you up on physics. If you are, have a growth mindset and you're, you're okay, it's okay for you to make mistakes and you, and you're okay with facing challenges and feeling like things are hard and you're not going to take that personally. You tend to be someone who can learn quicker and easier 
And whether you're really behind on chemistry, it doesn't matter because you're going to have the right mindset going into a very hard course than someone who is like, takes things very personally. And is like, Oh, I suck. I'll never be good at this. You know, if you, if you, so, and I'm not saying you guys, I think we all go through checks and balances in life where we have, we go through fixed mindset and growth mindset. I know I sure do. Um, I definitely have to check myself before I wreck myself sometimes where I'm like, uh, Jenny, you're being a little too harsh on yourself. And I think we all can be that way. Um, but it's really important to recognize when you're doing stuff like that, because it can really lead you down a very toxic road um, and one that can really hinder your long-term success. And so it's, it's not about where you are today. Like that's okay. If you have flaws, you will, we all do, but it's more about, can we, where are we? <laughs> like, Where do you fall in the big scheme of things between fixed mindset and a growth mindset? And how do you feel about challenges and making mistakes and, you know, who you are as a person, like if you were stripped of all your titles, would you, would you still feel confident? And, 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 and I know that's really hard to do. And this, this is not easy, but the more you start focusing on how you feel about yourself, the better you're going to be able to show up to the world and the better you're going to be able to show up for others, including yourself. And, and schools really want to screen for that to find someone who's a little more hardy, um, you know, cause Saturday school is going to be kind of brutal. They're going to, you're going to get kind of beat up and they want to make sure you're going to be okay. Um, that you're going to thrive not only academically, but in clinical. And so getting a handle on where you're at currently allows you to make steps forward. So it's okay if you're like, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, I have a lot of work to do. <laughs> it's okay. The fact that you're willing to admit that is actually a very good thing. If you're willing to reflect on whatever it may be and you say, maybe it is something that I could work on. Maybe it's not, maybe it's not that they're, like, I think people who, if you think of a fixed mindset, if people who say, well, the reason why I can't succeed is because they are hindering me because it's, they're making it hard for me and, and they're, you know, doing all those things to me and there's nothing wrong with me. It's them. It's kind of like, that's, that's a really fixed mindset. That's something that says like, okay, yes, there could be something in the outward outside world. That's not fair. That's always going to be the case. Like there's never going to be a situation in life. That's always going to be always in your favor, maybe on occasion. Cool. Take advantage of it. But when it's not, when you're like, man, this is really hard. It's just not fair. What's what, why are they succeeding? I'm not like, I'm better. And they're not blah, blah, blah. that you just have to just eliminate all those thoughts and say, I'm just going to focus on me and how can I improve? I will keep working on myself. Eventually you will find a way. And, and it's just about almost like self-acceptance with whatever that may be, whatever responsibility, accepting it for it's your own. And maybe your own feels really heavy and maybe that feels really bad compared to what you see other people dealing with, but it's your own and that's yours. <laughs> you, know, you, you have to own it. And so it's really about owning where you're at, even if it's a hindrance, even if it feels heavy and hard and doing the best you can with it, knowing that over time, you're going to mold yourself into someone who is going to be able to defeat that, that hurdle or whatever it may be. Um, but it's, it's, it's accepting that maybe you're flawed. It's accepting that maybe you don't Maybe you don't handle criticism the best. Maybe you get angry too quickly, or maybe you make assumptions about others, or maybe um, you you come across as defensive, even though you're like, really, I'm not, that's just how I talk. And maybe assessing your tone of voice, mm -hmm. your eye contact, and sometimes it's cultural. Sometimes you were taught to be this way and you're like, this is so not fair, Jenny. I was taught to do this. This was respectful in my culture. And it's not fair that they're seeing me as disrespectful when I'm, this was what I was born to believe is respectful. And trust me, I feel for you. I really do. That's, I, I can't even, I cannot imagine, but ultimately at the end of the day, it's what you have. It's, it's what you, it's who you are. And that's a beautiful thing, but that's what I'm saying. Own it, like accept it and say, how can I do something different? So that way in the eyes of a stranger, I don't get typecasted as someone who is disrespectful, even though I know I'm not trying, I know in my heart of hearts, that's not what I want to achieve. How can I reflect on that in a way that I would be seen differently by those that I know I'll be around in, in whatever it may be. And it sometimes, again, it, it, it takes a lot of like, I don't know how to describe it. It just, sometimes it just feels heavy. It just feels heavy. And again, unfair, but it's just the cards you're dealt, <laughs> you know? So again, you have to make the most of it, but you have to be willing to accept the fact that maybe your card is not the best card and you have to be willing to work on that card to make it better. Um, and even if that means kind of swallowing your pride and realizing that maybe you have to work on some things yourself that could have been stuff that you developed as a child, as a teenager, as an adult, that it just kind of feel more natural and normal to you because that's what you've been around. It's what you've been exposed to. It's time to assess that. And it's okay. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. You're not worthy. You're not capable of change. Everyone, everyone is capable of assessing who they are. You just have to be willing to do it. 
And it's, it's hard to look in the mirror <laughs> sometimes. It really is. And I know like when you're faced with a hard thing, sometimes you just want to ignore it because it just feels easier to neglect it than it does to face the harsh reality of this is what I have to deal with. I get it. Um, I, again, I find myself guilty of that a lot too, but the reality is that will never go away if you don't address it. Um, and it will always hinder you. So it's better to face the hard things and face it head on as painful and as hard as it may be than it is to just let it be in the background and always, always hinder you. At least that's how I feel about it. Um, and sometimes it's, and it's okay to get help too. Like if you need friends, family support, try to find people to support you, to help you through these things, have them help you assess yourself. If you're struggling with that. Um, and I totally went off on a tangent. Sorry. <laughs> I know you guys know I do that a lot. So you're probably used to that by now, but I think I'm gonna leave it at that for discussing, um, just ICU is a big deal. Obviously you have to have the right ICU experience, but knowing that they don't just look at ICU experience. I think a lot of people think, oh, I have to be a CV ICU nurse to be good for CRNA school. It's just not the case. Any fellow MICU nurses out there, high five to you, MICU nurse here, um, Richard Wilson, Dr. Richard Wilson, who's part of CSBA, he was a uh, uh, neuro ICU nurse. So again, went on to be successful, has been a CRNA faculty for over 12 years now wealth of information, but he was a neuro ICU nurse. You know, he didn't work in the, you know, so he didn't work in a CV ICU or anything like that. Just embrace the experience you have and be careful. You're not bouncing around too much. It's okay. If you want to um, change from say the medical ICU to the CV ICU, and you still have a solid year before you're applying to CRNA school. Cool. Do it. Like if that's what you want to do, it's okay to broaden your horizon, own the ICU experience you have, whether that's the PICU, the neonatal intensive care, own what you have and find your strengths. I know a lot of PICU nurses are like really anxious to go into the CRNA interview. So like, Oh no, I'm a PICU nurse. I'm like the minority here. They're going to think I, I don't have a vast enough knowledge. Well then brush up your knowledge, brush up on the, on the adult ICU knowledge. So if they do ask you, you're really prepared and they're like, wow, cool. And then embrace the strengths that you have. Maybe that's weight-based dosing. Maybe that's understanding different types of physiology between a one-year-old and a 10-year-old and different type of types of physiology with uh, respiratory fluid management, et cetera. You should own the strengths you have with the experience you have. You know, a MICU nurse is not going to have the same experience as a CVIC nurse, but that's okay because a MICU nurse has its, has their strengths too, that they should own similar to the IC, the CVIC nurse, they'd have their strengths that they should own. So just focus on that. Don't worry about being everything. Cause if you try to be everything, you're going to be nothing. <laughs> like you, you can't specialize in every single thing and be at the top of your game in every single area. So that's another problem too. When you jump around is you're going to be starting from the bottom of the barrel again. You know, typically when you're new in the ICU, whether you've been a CVICU nurse for two years, you go to the CVICU, they're not going to give you the sickest CVICU patients. They're going to make you earn it. They're going to make you get trained and start all over again. So it could take six, nine months before you start getting the sickest of the sickest patients and really getting trained in things like ECMO and balloon pump. So keep that in mind uh, before it, you may not just be able to wing it into a new ICU and be top of your game there. You're going to kind of probably start over again. Um, so it's not necessarily always the best thing to be jumping around. Um, not unencouraging it. If you plan it right with timing wise, if you have a, a really good rationale for wanting to do it, like maybe this unit is more supportive and can give you more um, opportunities for leadership roles and advanced um, modality management, things like that. Cool. Do it. But just know why you're doing it. Don't just do it because you think it's going to help if you have really solid ICU experience already. It's almost better, in my opinion, to, to get solid ICU experience, at least in one area and own that area um, and get leadership experience and things like that than to just jump around and start over again in a bunch of different units. Um, and then I want to read one last thing before we end this episode. It'll be a little bit shorter than my normal. I read that. Um, let's see. Okay. So this one is from Columbia's website. And I told you guys, I like to read Serenay School websites. <laughs> And that's always where I recommend for you to go to, to read out, to read information and take it, take it like seriously. Um, any other website, you should always question the authority of the website uh, before you take it for fact. Okay. What type of critical experience is required? Um, this was like on their FAQ area. Um, it says all critical care experience, including pediatric ICU is acceptable with the following exceptions. I love it when schools do this. This is like exciting because it, it, it's, this is, I wish all school websites had stuff like this. And a lot of them do, but not all, of, not all of them. So I'm gonna just give you that COA statement and they leave you the rest up for, you know, for debate. Um, they say, accept neonatal ICU. So they do not take NICU. Um, they do not take ICU float pool. They do not take PACU. They do not take ER experience. 
I've also, you know, seen people think that cath lab will count or OR will count. Um, and those usually do not count. Um, so again, um, there, and actually it says here, and I misspoke. So the neonatal ICU, ICU float pool, PACU and ER will be reviewed on a case by case basis. So again, a lot of schools will say absolutely not to these units. They're saying they'll actually review on a case by case basis. Now, if you don't have your job lined up yet for the ICU and you're like, okay, well, they'll review on a case by case basis. I'm good. I'll take that neonatal ICU position. But the reality is, you guys, this is not preferred, meaning whenever they say on an individual basis, on a case by case basis, what they're essentially saying is this is not our preferred situation or experience. But if you're a stellar applicant, otherwise, we're still going to review your application. Doesn't mean you're going to get an interview but we'll still review your application. I don't know if that's really how you want to choose to go into your application cycle. Like if it's all you have choice you have, because you didn't know any better and you just wanted to, you just randomly decide to apply to Columbia and you're like, Oh darn, they don't take ER experience, but my other school does. Well then sure. Take, take the risk. But I wouldn't, if this was like your dream school and the one school you really want to go to, and you knew they only considered these units on a case by case basis, I would not pick the ER as your mainstay experience because they don't necessarily prefer it. Um, They also hear state that operating room telemetry, step down, cath lab, interventional lab experience is not acceptable. So they completely do not take any of those, um, but they will consider, again, the ICU float pool, PACU and ER on an individual in the NICU on an individual case by case basis. So these are the types of um, gold nuggets that you should be looking for when you're doing your, your school research for what types of ICU experience make for uh, CRNA school admissions. Um, Now, as far as ICU experience goes and how it plays out in anesthesia school, as far as clinical performance, et cetera, et cetera, you guys, it doesn't, I've been a preceptor for almost 10 years now, Um, everywhere from newbies the first day um, to senior students, uh, you know, during very hard rotations like cardiac and and, and pediatric rotations. I don't know what ICU they came from. It doesn't even matter. I don't even, I don't even ask most of the time. I just want to know usually whether they're freshmen or senior anesthesia students, because that gives me an idea of what their knowledge base is. That's usually all I care about. Um, I don't care where they worked as an ICU nurse. As long as I ask out of curiosity, but I, it just doesn't matter. And, And the thing is what matters more about with the type of unit is the attitude you bring, right? Are you open and willing to be a novice again? Are you open and willing to learning? Are you curious? Do you take self uh, initiative to look things up versus asking questions all the time? And asking questions is not bad. So don't take that the wrong way. But you also have to be willing to look things up yourself. (laughs) If you're always going to be dependent on someone else to tell you what things are, you're just, you need to help yourself sometimes. You need to dig in the textbook and read through your resources and try to find answers. Because if you show that motivation to look things up, to try to learn yourself, sure, you may not always find the right answer, but if you at least showed initiative to try night and day, you're always going to get a better response from your preceptor or from whoever colleague you're working with. than if you just don't know, and you don't care to look up and you're just going to ask <laughs> some, some of them might say, well, go look it up. <laughs> you know, They won't even tell you. And, and it kind of just like a slap in the face. So again, when it comes to being prepared to start CRNA school, it's more about taking self-initiative and motivation to do some self-education because depending on where or what program you go to, whether you're integrated or front-loaded, you, you may not have had a lot of anesthesia knowledge up front prior to, especially some of your specialty rotations and things of that nature, or you may, maybe you have, but it's been a year since you've touched it. And so it's just about preparing yourself and taking initiative to do it on your own. Um, even if it means doing it before you even get to it in class or before, maybe it's a year after you've gotten into it in class. Um, so the ICU, in my humble opinion, what it does the best doesn't matter again, what unit you come from, you know, it prepares you to critically think and, and essentially troubleshoot. It allows you to say, okay, something doesn't seem right. And why is that? Or, Oh, they, they are doing this and this and this test and ordering this lab. Why is that? It allows you to think those throughs wise through, because when you're in the operating room, you're going to be doing the same thing all the time. Well, this happened. Why is that? Or what could I do? Or what are the, some of the things that I could try to mediate the situation? Or if this happens, what would I do? Or if this happens, what would I do? Or if the surgeon does this, what would I do? You, you always kind of ask yourself, okay, 
this is how I see this playing out in my mind. This is how I want to go, but this is my plan A, plan B and plan C. And maybe I even have a plan, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, (laughs) but you always want to have, you know, some, some things in mind, emergency situation, things that, what would you do if X, Y, and Z happen that are like worst case scenario. Um, And you do those things in the ICU. So no matter where you work in the MICU, SICU, CVICU, you're doing those things because you're taking very critical, critically sick patients who can shift at any moment and go from being stable to very unstable. Um, And in your, 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 titrating all kinds of different drugs, taking different orders, seeing different treatment modalities, dealing with different pathophysiology processes and allowing you to critically think like, okay, what's next? And how can I stay ahead of this train wreck (laughs) so I can keep them going on the track? Um, You know, you're you're practicing those skills as an ICU nurse. And sometimes surgery turns into that too, (laughs) where you're just trying to keep the train on the track before it goes off the rails. Um, And you're trying to think like, how can I make this, how can I build the track as the train's going? Um, kind of situation. And so you get that kind of practice as an ICU nurse. Um, Now, the majority of anesthetics, you know, relatively smooth sailing, but having that background and thinking critically like that, and allowing you to troubleshoot and work through difficult situations under stress, under pressure, is kind of where you're, what you're getting as an ICU nurse and getting exposed to. So when you're exposed to this acutely in the OR, you're not going to freak out because you're like, okay, I've done this, but I've dealt with really critical sick patients before in critical situations where I've had to have good team communication. I've had to delegate. I've had to use closed loop communication. I've had to really assess the situation and determine what would I do first, second, and third, um, and, and know why you would do those things. And so understanding the why behind why you're doing certain things and how certain drugs work and different uh, pathophysiology processes work is really what you're gathering out of your time in the ICU. So it, to me, whether you're in the MICU, SICU, or CVIC, you're getting a lot of valuable experience as long as the acuity is there um, and you're getting exposed to those critical, high intense uh, situations. Um, that's that's really what it is about at the end of the day. And again, you know, the type of ICU specialty, while I think a lot of schools prefer that you have some type of um, exposure to cardiac, everyone has a heart. <laughs> you mean the SICU and you have a heart, in the MICU you have a heart, in the neuro ICU you have a heart. People can have neurological injury and still have heart conditions. People can be in the MICU and still have heart conditions. People can be in the SICU and have heart conditions. And and so while maybe they would go to a different unit for ECMO, you may still see a swan in the MICU and you still definitely dealing with heart failure for sure. Um, Significant heart failure. So again, uh, but you're not going to get that fresh post um, open heart. You're not going to get a fresh thoracotomy. You're not going to see that, but you know, while some fresh open hearts are very sick and, but some of them, they, they're actually seem to be pretty, they usually bounce back pretty nicely. Um, I know from my time doing open heart and working in the medical ICU, I felt like the medical ICU patients were on their last thread and hanging on by just a string. Um, and they had, you know, multiple comorbidities, you know, renal failure, heart failure. I mean, maybe they had a brain tumor on top of that. And I mean, I don't know, they had everything under the sun, um, sepsis and GI bleed and like all combined, um, thyroid storm. And I mean, all kinds of stuff, they had all kinds of stuff. And again, always involving cardiac, usually to some extent. Uh, so was it a bad place to get experience? No, it was a wonderful place to get experience, but I owned it. I didn't have ECMO experience, but I definitely had CRRT. I dealt with a lot of renal failure. I also had the HFOV, you know, the high frequency oscillating ventilator experience, people who have really severe ARDS, um, those types of things. So own the experience where you get it and don't worry about the rest. Um, just make sure that whatever ICU you're picking, that it's something your schools will consider open handedly. Like, yes, we take you no questions asked. That's the best way to go into your application. Remember red flag is individual basis. That's a red flag or on a case by case basis. That's a red flag. If it's all you got and it's too late to make a change, the applications are due and you tried to just threw in an extra school for the hang of it, well then go for it. But if you have a choice and you're planning for it, I would just avoid those red flags if you can um, to give yourself the best chance possible. And again, um, acuity matters. If your patients are getting shipped out because they're getting too sick for your ICU, get in your car and follow the ambulance and go apply for a job at that hospital. Um, Now, some people are like, well, that's an hour or two hours away. I mean, I'm not saying you need to do this, 
But I am saying I know people who have traveled over an hour away to get good ICU experience because they didn't have an option to move or relocate. I've also known students who maybe do relocate. So they're only maybe 45 minutes from family and 45 minutes from the hospital. So they can at least not have a terrible commute every day. So they can still get that really valuable ICU experience because where they actually are from, there's nothing to pick from. I mean, people do make those sacrifices and I hate, you know, it's as unfair as it may seem, the students who tend to make those sacrifices tend to find the success where the ones who just stay in the very low acuity hospital who barely ever see a ventilator, they usually don't get an interview. Um, and there are some remote, uh, rural remote hospitals that are, are very high acuity that have very little resources that are a great experience. So I'm not poo-pooing that at all, but just make sure that that, if that's your situation, that you're making sure that you're highlighting that on your resume, the experiences you are getting and what type of drips you're seeing, ventilators you're seeing, advanced life support you're seeing. And if you're questioning at all, whether it's good enough, talk to your program faculty, go to the open houses, come to our conference, CSB conference, which actually already passed. So sorry, it was a teaser. I know it's probably like September by the time this is airing, um, but talk to your program faculty. It's always the best way to clear the air explain. And uh, I've always said, like, when you send emails to program faculty, make sure you're not putting it as an open-ended question. Make sure you're actually saying, this is my experience. This is what I routinely get on my ICU. This is where I work. I want to make sure I'm putting my best foot forward, applying to your program in the upcoming year. You know, now's the time that I'm able, if I'm able to switch, these are my options, or maybe I don't really have much of an option to switch. Would you consider this as good ICU experience? Or would I be kind of setting myself up for, you know, not, not, not the best, um, not the best odds or whatever it may be. So that's my recommendation. If you're questioning at all your ICU experience. So, all right. Well, thank you guys so very much for tuning in and I will see you next month. I hope you guys have been enjoying the guest episodes. I know I mentioned it in the last episode in August, but since I'm only doing one episode a month at this point, um, I am taking a break or a hiatus from the uh, podcast. Um, we are currently in the process of having twins. Um, I had to get admitted into the hospital the end of August, early September for very close monitoring. Um, you can Google it, but these are called mono mono twins and they share one amniotic sac and their cords are all tangled. So um, this is really a day by day kind of pregnancy. It's incredibly stressful. Um, so good thing I have critical care experience. <laughs> Just kidding. It's a little bit different when you're on the other side of things, but all that being said, funniness aside, um, I'm still here for you guys. I still plan on continuing the podcast. I've been doing the guest episodes. I hope you guys have been enjoying them. Um, and hopefully I, you know, things will, um, come back to its more normal course towards the end of the year. But if, if I'm still here for you guys and don't plan on ever giving up this podcast, um, I appreciate you definitely, definitely love you all. Thank you for tuning in and I will see you next month. All right. Take care until then. Hey, Teacher CRNA, as always, I appreciate you and your loyalty. Thank you so very much for tuning in this week. I'd love to hear from you, so screenshot this episode and share it to your IG stories with your biggest takeaway. Don't forget to tag me at Sierra School Prep Academy so I can personally thank you. Be sure to head over to SierraSchoolPrepAcademy.com to check out our blog and gather free resources to help you along your Sierra journey. Stay strong, and I'll see you next week.